Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. Uh, my name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today I'm gonna go over a presentation. Uh, I threw it together, it involves uh, housing starts, it involves a lot of ratios. I'm gonna look at previous commodity bull markets and overlay that on some of these charts. We're gonna look at inventory data for real estate, <clears throat> housing starts, uh, we're gonna look at the ratios, um, we're going to look at some of the things of, you know, if someone positioned a certain way based off ratios, how successful would they be? Does the ratio go up and down a lot? Uh, would we have false sell signals, false buy signals? Like, we, we can take a look at all this. And we can, we're using history to basically develop a strategy of how to invest. So it's not developing a strategy based off of what we want that strategy to be. We're developing a strategy based off history and what basically works as an investor. So it's it's a historical model that is developed to, to not a model, I should say a historical strategy that's developed based off of the data. And then we can look at previous bull markets in commodities, uh, see what kind of pullbacks they, they experienced during those uh, bull markets. Uh, and then kind of just, you know, give you more information on where we are today. So let's dive in. I'll show you what I've got. <clears throat> I kind of threw this together uh, with a bunch of different uh, charts and stuff and some, some information. And you guys can determine what you think is relevant or irrelevant, um, how you want to play this. <clears throat> I'm still long my commodities. Um, and, I'll, and I'll give you the reasoning why. And... Uh, I'll probably be buying even more once this pullback kind of slows down uh, in a couple of areas. Uh, and obviously, if you guys want to know what I'm buying, you can subscribe to the Platinum membership below. Um, that is the uh, the membership that gets you access to everything that I'm doing uh, and what I'm doing. And right now, I'm kind of I'm just relaxing. I'm I'm building up some cash, and I'm waiting for a bottom in some of these things. But let's go through this this presentation. And uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments section below. Um, we're going to go through a whole bunch of different things here. So I'm going to first start here with the annual U.S. Housing Starts data from 1890 to 2015. It's a very large um, <clears throat> chart here. So here's the annual U.S. Housing Starts. Uh, one thing that you that you can notice when just looking at the charts, uh, and then we can kind of look at inflation data, uh, and I'm going to kind of just talk about inflation. We had a very large inflationary period from 1940s all the way till 1980. Uh, it was an increasing interest rate environment during that time frame. Now, during that time frame, we had the housing starts, the annual U.S. housing starts go up. In the mid-1940s, the housing starts basically went to an entirely new level uh, and maintained an entirely new level at a very high level. In fact, we peaked out in the in the mid 1970s for the housing starts going up to almost two and a half million uh, housing starts. Notice how during that time frame we peaked in inflation during that same time frame. So this entire level up here is a new level of housing starts in relationship to the old level of housing starts in the 18 and early 1900s which was far lower. Uh, so we had this large inflationary kind of push higher. Uh, and what that means is that there was more loans coming into the system, uh, creating a higher M2 money supply in a higher inflationary environment. We also had a highly inflationary environment in the 1920s all the way till 1930. Uh, basically, we went below the average here. Once we went below the average, we had a deflationary collapse. Uh, that was a housing market boom that collapsed. So when looking at history, whenever we get the housing starts to basically ramp up, we get these uh, leveraging up phases, leveraging up phase, leveraging up phase, and then a bust and a bust. And then we had another big leveraging up phase that lasted for a long time from the mid 40s to the 1980. We had a bust after 1980. And then we had another boom uh, from 2000 onward with a larger real estate market and a little inflationary environment. And uh, I don't have the data for the most recent stuff on this particular chart because this is just a long-term one. I'll show you some other data uh, more recently of what's going on. 
And this is the annual private U.S. housing starts per 1,000 households. And this is just showing it per 1,000 households or per capita, depending how you want to divide this thing out. Uh, but it has been declining somewhat, which means that we're building less homes uh, per person um, to some degree, and especially very much so during these bottoming periods uh, of about five, 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 and almost five here, uh, which means we were underbuilding in relationship to the population. And we had done that in the mid 1910s, uh, early, early 1920s, early 2010s period. And we are underbuilt given how many people there were. So we did go into an underbuilt scenario. Um, before, you know, after these underbuilt scenarios, we've always had these large increases uh, of homes being built. Um, we, we did have a pause here in 1940 where it pulled back and went again. Uh, but we, the, what I'm trying to get across is it's an underbuilt scenario that we're going to uh, right now. And looking at this, it says the Biden administration takes aim at America's housing shortage. Uh, they're also admitting that we have a shortage that was posted May 17th, 2022. The nation faces a shortage of 5.5 million homes, a gap so large it would take more than a decade to close, uh, even if new home construction accelerates. So the, at least from this National Association of Realtors and what they think and the data that they have, and I believe it to be true, is that they think that we're at a five and a half million home shortage and it's going to take over a decade to really close that gap. And other people are also, the administration are recognizing that. Another thing that I was looking at, this was posted in 2021, people who bought new homes probably won't see them finished anytime soon due to a record builder backlog. The backlog of homes waiting to be built hit a record high last month, according to government data. Home building companies have warned that supply constraints have impacted building goals. Uh, earlier this year, uh, Freddie Mac, another agency, reported that U.S. is facing a shortage of 3.8 million homes. And I've read the, the shortage anywhere between, I've seen as low a figures of 1 to 2 million all the way up to 7 million homes. I don't know the exact figure. I don't know if anyone really does because they're all estimates. Uh, but a, I would say a, a pretty good average is about 4 to 5 million a home deficit is what I've seen. It, it is on is an average, but the one thing I want you to pull from here is this record builder backlog, the backlog of homes and the supply chain shortages uh, and the supply constraints to get those homes finished. So uh, another thing I wanted to look at here is the thirty-year fixed rate mortgage, the average in the United States. Uh, we've been coming down from nineteen eighty. Remember that huge um, graph here. 1980, we we basically peaked out uh, in this home building, and then we came down. We did it a little bit here, but we we came all the way lower. And the rates are very, uh, it's similar to the housing starts. It's basically your rates will increase based off the demand for loans and how much money is in the system. Uh, inflation. So the demand for loans and inflation are tied together. That was that huge period from the 40s all the way to 1980 was a large increasing interest rate environment. That large increasing interest rate environment, in my opinion, is tied to this home starts as it went to an entirely new level. And the change in home starts is what caused this increase in interest rates. We have another change in housing starts that are starting to occur more recently, and we're seeing a mortgage, uh, a fixed rate mortgage go up too in the United States. Uh, it is drastically increased uh, in a very short period of time, especially from a very low level. So the multiples that it's gone up has been quite dramatic, and that has had an uh, impact on the markets, and it will slow the market down. So we've got an increasing interest rate environment uh, just recently here, and this is the monthly supply of new houses in the United States. Uh, what I put on here were the were the buy and sell signals uh, of basically your commodity bull market. Uh, a buy signal for commodity bull market when the housing month supply is low, it goes up and then they're high. The monthly supply are, are very high. Low in 99 was the, the commodity bull market's buy signal and the sell signal was in 2008. Buy, sell, we had another sell in 80. This would have been a really tough one to, to capture. Uh, you'd have to know your demographics inside and out to capture 
the top of the 1980 bull market. The reason we had a pullback is because of the month's supply. We went into an oversupply in the mid-1970s and things started to collapse. Uh, the inflation pulled back in that, in that cycle. And I think it was tied to the housing, the housing cycle. Now this, remember, this is monthly supply of new houses. New houses, not existing, new. So we had an overbuilt and an overbuilt scenario in the mid 1970s and the late 19 and early 1980s. We had an overbuilt scenario in 2008. Now remember the backlog I was talking about new homes. I don't know if this backlog, you know, this monthly supply of new houses, I'm not sure if this is everything because we have a huge backlog of homes that are that are short, uh things that they can't sell. We also have a large amount of homes that are in the process of being built. So we went into a very low scenario where the month's supply of new homes went very low. That's very bullish. Usually we get an inflationary move after it. We had a commodity buy signal um, come, and I don't see any sell signal yet. And this seven months of supply, 7.7 .7 months, I don't know if that's a bunch of homes that can't be sold based off of supply problems. So it's it's difficult to say that this is a legit signal because of the supply and backlog problems that we have in the housing, you know, the new housing industry with uh, supply chains. But right now we are not at over overly high levels compared to last sell signal bull um, sell signal markets in terms of monthly supply of new houses. For existing homes, uh, you can see we, we were in bubble territory. And I'm just going to go back. Existing homes were high here and here and here. Uh, so we not only had new homes, new, new, you know, new houses that were in oversupply, we also had existing inventory. Today, we've got very low inventory and it is increasing. Uh, don't get me wrong. It is increasing with those high mortgage rates. But what's, what's happening is these bubbles, these were all... These bubbles in here were all um, a, a resultant of weakness in the housing market. Weakness in the housing market. What we have today is weakness caused not by the housing market in its inventory levels. It's weakness with mortgage rates. Now, the question that you have to ask yourself is, are mortgage rates going to stay high if the inflation pulls back? or if we have a recession and does the demand for these homes still exist does that five and a half million home deficit matter and that's that's really the question that everyone should be asking is if we pull back interest rates what is that going to do to these figures of new housing inventory and existing housing inventory we are booming because we have no inventory the inventory is starting to come back, but at least I'm speculating that it's based off of the interest rates, uh, that the markets are slowing down and that the inventories will build to some degree and the rate of increase will go down. I agree with all of that. But can that interest rate remain high if we have a recession? And my guess is probably not. So the interest rates is probably going to have to come back. And again, that is me speculating. Uh, that's me speculating that the Federal Reserve is going to do uh, quantitative easing and, and do some sort of yield curve control. They may not. They may completely crash uh, the stock market to, to, try to, to try to contain inflation. Uh, and if the inflation goes away, I think they're going to ease and then the inflation will come back because it's a, that's the type of scenario we're in. And I think that the, the existing home inventory will go down. I think that the new home inventory will go down if we can fix supply chains. And the affordability of homes would come back. So they're in a they're in a tough spot where they're trying to manage inflation and a deficit in the housing market at the same time. <clears throat> and I know some people will try to argue the deficit in in the uh, housing market. But you know, I, I believe that this is a true statement that they're that they're that they're releasing in these articles. I don't think they're trying to mislead anybody with a false uh, housing shortage, and and I'm sure 
that they've taken into account the the deaths from older people who are dying and all sorts of stuff. So <clears throat> looking at this, uh, we've got these boom periods uh, from 1990 all the way to 2008 was a gigantic boom period. Um, that was an 18 year, nine year, um, about a nine year recovery phase and then a nine year um, boom phase. Uh, that is your expansionary phase. This is the real estate cycle. And now we're coming back into a boom phase. That phase can slow down with a rapid increase in interest rates uh, for mortgages. I agree with that. But it's being increased against a very strong market. Uh, a lot of these other markets, the interest rates were increased as that market was very mature and the inventory levels were very high. Uh, so that basically pricked the bubble so to speak. Uh, and then that, that would come on down. <clears throat> I, we don't have that inventory uh, in the housing market that doesn't exist. We are coming from what I would consider to be the strongest portion of the real estate cycle. So inventories can build, but we're not, we're not at a level where I think real estate is going to crash. We also don't have all these foreclosures like we had last time in 2005, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, we are very low in foreclosures. And this is the ratio. This is the commodity index to S&P 500 ratio. The ratio is very low in 70, 99, and 2020. It was low even in the uh, mid to late uh, 2010s. So um, commodities are not in a bubble in relationship to stocks, at least. And the sell points are usually around seven. Seven or eight is a sell point for commodity to S&P 500 ratio, seven or eight. Now, <clears throat> those circles, I did overlay on these. The red circles were sell signals based off of um, the housing market, basically. And that's also, I didn't put them on the other one, but that's, that's there. And right now, if you look at current um, ratios, a ratio on this chart of 0 0.02, low 0.02s is kind of a high point, and we're only at 0 0.005. Uh, could we have a pullback? Yeah, we're getting the pullback right now, and yes, it is possible to have a pullback, but we have a lot more valuation that we can compress upward if we're in the middle or early stages of a commodity bull market in relationship to stocks. And I don't see any reason from a housing perspective to say that that we're overbuilt, that we are in some sort of bubble yet, <clears throat> and that our inventories are, are at, at bubble territories yet. Uh, I don't think we're there yet, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have a pullback. And what I'm trying to identify is, is this a pullback in the middle of a big bull market, or is this an ending uh, trend, you know, end of trend type movement? I don't think it's an end of trend type movement based on where we are in the housing real estate cycle. And I think it's just a regular uh, pullback after we'll call this wave one, a pullback, and then we'll go to a larger wave coming up. <clears throat> so in the ratio, I've got some other ratios here. This is the gold to oil ratio. Uh, what I did is I overlaid um, the ratio of gold to oil. Gold when it's a when when gold can buy over 30 barrels of oil uh, oil is cheap so you want to buy oil at the top of these markets here this would have been a buy signal in 1970 you'd ride it all the way down to a ratio that's 10 or below <clears throat> this here is when you'd want to sell it in 1980 that is when you'd sell it uh here you'd want to buy it in the early 2000s and you'd want to sell it in 2008 uh, you could have also sold it here when it came all the way down. It did a bounce. That would have been really difficult to hit the 2008 top. But you could have also sold it um, in like mid-2000s. two thousand, uh, mid two thousands. But if you had used the housing starts, you would have wanted to hold all the way till 2008 in using the monthly supply of new houses. So you would have held, 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 and then got rid of it. Held, held, held. You could have sold it here, bought it back, and then sold it. But that, this was a, a much harder um, 
bull market to navigate. But the demographic did dip here and then went came in, and came back. You have to really know your demographics. The demographics are are higher here, and we have a sh home shortage. So I think that we could go potentially higher. Uh, and then there's our anomaly where we, we want to buy oil down here in the 2020s. And I think it's going to go below 10 once again. Uh, our current gold to oil ratio is at 17.37. Uh, might even be over 18 today because I took this in the morning before the markets were open. And uh, we are still not at a ratio below 10. We're not even close. We're more towards the average to slightly cheap. Uh, looking at crude oil, the light crude oil futures, I overlaid where we should have purchased based off the commodity to stock ratio. The ratio would have had us enter in 1999, and it would have had us sell at 2008, uh, and that's the 2008 top. In between this, we have some massive pullbacks in oil. We had a 54% pullback from basically 2000 all the way to the bottom of 2001. We had another 37% pullback in 2003, a 28% pullback in 2004, a 22% pullback in 05, and then a 36.62% pullback in 06. And then in 06. Yeah, 06. And then we have that final blow off top. This wasn't an easy ride. Uh, I'm interested in riding this from circle to circle. I'm not interested in trying to time every single market uh, dip and move. Uh, I'm trying to ride the whole thing. Why do I want to ride the whole thing? It's the most profitable and the least risk to ride it from circle to circle. Uh, as long as I use new new monthly home starts and, and, I, and I use all these other things. To, to use this as, as a as a gauge um, <clears throat> to catch all these moves these little tiny moves you can get kicked out of the of the trade or the position uh, I want to I want to go from here to there and that this move in some of these stocks uh, are, are can be equivalent to 100 times your money uh, I don't need these small movements to be right I don't need that to be right I have enough money where this will change my life uh, if only a few of them do it and I'm taking a bunch of different sectors where we could get these large uh, returns with not as much money. I can diversify out, diversify into it, and really start to uh, to hit it big. So this isn't an easy ride. You'll see multiple pullbacks within this bull market. And this is the commodity itself. You don't even want to know what the, the companies themselves, they, they've had some massive pullbacks in here. But this was the recession uh, in 2001-2002. We had a 54% pullback in oil. Uh, that's something that you may have to endure before the next big uh, up move cycle. And usually the biggest pullback is the one that comes after the first wave. Uh, usually it's around 60%. Uh, in this case, it was 54%. But uh, you know we could very much be experiencing that right now. And I do think that we're coming from a position of strength in the real estate market, not from a position of weakness like we did in 2006, 7, and 8. Uh, looking at the platinum to gold ratio, there's another one from, I didn't have the data before this, 75 to 1980. That would have been a nice bull market run, but you'd have to endure one big pullback in the middle uh, before that spiking top. We also had 1997-98, uh, another buy signal all the way till about 2000. Uh, this is what, 2001. And remember, this is the platinum to gold ratio. Uh, so these ratios, we, we would have gotten a buy signal on platinum. It would have outperformed in the beginning of that bull market. And you'd want to swap your platinum uh, out for either gold or silver in the middle of that bull market. Silver would be a good one, to, I think, to, to swap to because it was still incredibly cheap in that time frame that platinum was expensive. Um, this is platinum to gold ratio right now. Uh, notice that we are at 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is where this, this bottom of the chart starts at. Um, 0.5 is cheaper than any time in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, uh, and even today. 
Um, so we are at a ratio that is basically off the charts uh, low of 0.5. Uh, I swapped all my, uh, not all my, I swapped some of my gold for platinum in April of 2020. And I'm beefing up my positions in platinum based off of this ratio, based off of um, what this is telling us in terms of value uh, in relationship to other metals. Uh, platinum is probably the cheapest asset against any other uh, asset in the world. And platinum, because of how cheap it is, will substitute palladium. It will substitute other uh, metals where it can. <clears throat> I also think that platinum has production peaked in 2006. Uh, so we're living on borrowed time. And I don't think the renewable uh, electric vehicle, um, I don't think they can make as many electric vehicles as what people think they can. And I think we're going to have to go uh, the hybrid route to meet the demand of the markets. Uh, and, and that's going to require vastly more palladium and platinum. Uh, and if platinum's substituting palladium, I think that platinum is going to be an incredible investment uh, based off of potential uses in the future and existing uses today. Hybrid vehicles, since they don't run as hot, need to be loaded with larger amounts of platinum and palladium. And palladium is already having problems. Any problem in palladium will be a problem for platinum. And if we've peaked production in platinum, uh, I don't think that platinum will necessarily be easily um, produced out of the ground or mined out of the ground because we're going after lower and lower ore grades and South Africa is really the big dog there. It's 80% of production. <clears throat> and those mines are getting old and they're exhausted. Here's the platinum to, produ uh, platinum to palladium ratio. Uh, you can see uh, when this ratio is low, you want to buy platinum. And then you ride it up and you want to exchange it for palladium when this ratio is high. So palladium is where these red arrows are at the top, or red circles. And then the bottom circles would have been platinum purchases. Now, I've got a red circle here. We are far, far low. Um, at this ratio, we're at 0.44 for platinum to palladium ratio. Uh, what is this? This is signaling that platinum is incredibly cheap to palladium and that uh, at some point here, they're going to substitute platinum for palladium. And at 0.44, you are below any level in history of uh, this ratio. So platinum is the cheapest metal uh, of any metal. And I also think it has some incredible value going forward uh, in its uses in catalytic converters, <clears throat> in hydrogen fuel cells, uh, in a whole bunch of different things that we could potentially use it for in the future, uh, and especially hybrid vehicles where they deploy uh we'll call it deploy batteries and internal combustion engines and higher catalytic converter loadings for emissions and if palladium has a problem platinum has a problem uh, because they're substitutable metals uh to some to some extent uh so that's that's the platinum to palladium uh this here is the gold to silver ratio and the ratio here is when you want to buy silver uh, of course i bought in this circle on this side over here um, I bought as much as I could, bought from individuals and whatnot. But uh, right now, we have we are very cheap in the gold to silver ratio. We're above 90 at this point. Uh, but these were the bottoms of the ratio, and you can see how this cycles back and forth. Here's the current gold to silver ratio, we're at 92 or so. And we are very cheap for silver in relationship to gold. Uh, platinum is cheap in relationship to silver as well. Uh, I do think that we will see an outperformance of platinum to silver in the beginning of the bull market, uh, which we haven't seen yet. Uh, and I also think that the bull market for commodities uh, is still very young. And I think what happened is we got our first taste of it coming on down. We're starting to pull on back. And we're going to do a retest of this breakout. So we broke out. We're going to do a retest. And then we're going to drive down in a very big wave, uh, considered a third wave. Uh, this here is the gold to silver ratio. <clears throat> This is the ratio heading lower, and you can see the cycle of low to high, low to high, low to high, and then I think this will cycle back down. Uh, what this will ultimately get to, I'm not 100% sure. It's probably going to be something below 50. Um, looking at this, we got to 65, so I don't think that was the necessary uh, peak or the low. Uh, so I think we, we're going to cycle back up, and then we'll 
break back down again at some point. But <clears throat> the thing I really want everyone to kind of gain out of this uh, when looking at all this is basically we haven't even done the bull market in commodities. Uh, a commodity bull market usually has platinum take off kind of towards the beginning. Uh, that really starts to rocket higher, and we haven't done that yet. It hasn't happened. And we haven't had a uh, a full valuation change of oil in relationship to gold. Um, all of these metrics that or all these ratios that I watch, we haven't seen them basically materialize. Uh, so I don't think the commodity bull market has even really come in any sort of way. And none of the ratios got to expensive levels. None of them. They're all still cheap and they're all still relatively um, they're all relatively cheap and haven't really made their move yet. <clears throat> so, and that includes other ones too, like uranium and, and other ratios. So um, I think that interest rates have slowed down the housing market. And it is, it is definitely weird how fast everything sold off in a lot of these uh, markets. Everyone is basically anticipating a recession. And usually that kind of comes almost opposite. You see the data weaken first, especially in like housing starts, inventories. You see that all kind of weaken first, and then you see almost like a transition. But this, this time around, uh, we're starting to just see people lead with selling pressure. Uh, we still have demand and supply fundamental problems in the market with energy. Uh, I have not seen that even basically give up or, or release. It, it's still in the market. So this is all fears, I guess, in the market <clears throat> of things that haven't happened yet. And it's it's a little bit weird to see all that. It is. Uh, I wouldn't have. I would not have guessed that. Usually, at least off of previous cycles. We've seen interest rates kick up slow, more slowly than what we've seen, especially not as fast as we've seen in the mortgage rates and whatnot, more slowly coming up. And then we see all these kind of markets become overvalued. Uh, we see uranium take a big run when interest rates are going up. We see oil take a big run and we see all of those things kind of take off. Now, there's a couple of things that I find kind of weird uh, in this, and I'll go over it right here and show you what I mean. Um, so if I were to pull up trading view and we look at uh, the 10 year yield, let's say, uh, usually when the 10 year yield goes up, of course, I got these all up there. I was doing some analysis. Usually the 10 year yield and the uh, oil are very highly correlated. So if I were to pull put up an oil chart here, and, and, and show you guys the correlation here. So there it is. So basically, if the 10-year yield goes up, oil goes up with it. Uh, oil's this this gold line, and, and the 10-year yield uh, is this line. They're, they're usually highly connected and correlated. Uh, it's almost as if <clears throat> someone pushed this lower, and people are using this market as a gauge for... Um, for inflation and fear and all that stuff. But we've had a decline in the in the interest rates and now we have a nice big move uh, in the 10 year yield higher today, 3.31%. But we're not seeing a same equivalent move in crude oil. We were down three point whatever percent in crude oil. So it's almost like we've got this short term decoupling between the 10 year yield and the crude oil. Now. I don't know on the short, short term. I'm, I don't know if this is going to go a little bit lower. We do have some momentum here. Uh, and I know a lot of people, they they like to, especially in the comment section, uh, when something's negative, they go full negative. And when something's positive, they go full positive. Uh, you guys got to get out of that mindset. It, it, just because you've got oil pulling back some doesn't mean you have to go full negative. doesn't mean that we're just going to go to $65 a barrel. Um, and short-term price movements are the hardest to predict. And I've seen a lot of people get this wrong. I've seen a lot of people do Elliott Wave analysis, you know, guys who are supposedly really good, guys or girls. Uh, they get it wrong a lot of the times. And that's why I don't play the short-term moves because a lot of those short-term moves get it wrong a lot of the time. And I don't want to get kicked out of my position. 
the holding that position is is prob for me is one of the most important things. I want to be long when I'm supposed to be long. I want to be sh out of it when I'm supposed to be out of it. Uh, I don't really do any shorting. I would rather just be long stocks or long commodities and swap between those two. But right now, we've raised interest rates in the middle of a very strong period. We're not doing it in the form of, of, of weakness. Now, <clears throat> raising rates that fast and that much will hurt stocks and bonds. But what we need to keep our eyes on are the supply demand fundamentals of oil. Because remember, I just showed you how correlated oil and interest rates are. Interest rates are basically, are, is it, they're going to rotate money out of stocks and bonds. And if oil is still in a weird spot where we don't have a supply demand balance, where supply is not keeping up with demand, I think, at least the way that I think, <clears throat> is that will translate into uh, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. That's why Germany. If you look at Germany's prices, they've gone skyrocketing because natural gas and oil energy is a feedstock and an input to all their costs. So their CPI is going to go ballistic. That's exactly what we've seen. So the question then is, can interest rates impact the supply of oil and natural gas? Do we have our energy under control? And if they want to bring inflation down, they being the Federal Reserve, they're going to have to attack crude oil and natural gas. The question is, are the paper markets, even if these paper markets fall, will they solve the real world supply demand problems? I don't think they will. I don't think that they can crush the demand in a meaningful way to correct that. Everyone thinks and supposes that demand will just get crushed for oil. Maybe that is. We just haven't seen it yet. That's what I'm looking for. And I'm going to remain long so long that the ratios tell me to remain long. <clears throat> and I'm going to remain long so long that the supply demand fundamentals are good for oil. And I think that will lead to inflation. They're in a, they're in a tough spot. And I know a lot of people are looking at the pricing the past couple of days and saying, oh, oil is going to 65, demand destruction, X, Y, Z. We'll see. We'll see. I'm not betting that it is or isn't. What I'm telling is we need to look for actual demand destruction to occur. Uh, if demand destruction doesn't occur, uh, this would be a buying opportunity. If it does occur, then we could have a recession. That is very well uh, probable. So that's where I'm at, and that's where my feelings are at, <clears throat> and that's kind of where the market conditions are at and the ratios. Uh, so that's what I've got for today. If you guys like this type of analysis, uh, definitely subscribe to the Platinum membership below uh, for my website. You get this type of information. Uh, you can directly access me during question and answer sessions if you're a Platinum member to ask me questions about this type of analysis. Uh, I know some people, they want more of a trading uh, platform. I am more of financial education and playing the big moves, uh, not trading in and out. I'm more of for people who uh, have a day job who, are, who go to work, add value, and want to invest over long periods of time. Uh, I am not someone who's going to be trying. I mean, I try to time the purchases. Don't get me wrong there. Uh, Short-term timing is the most difficult. And I know people want to make money as, as quickly as possible, uh, except your risk goes way up if you try to shorten the time frame of making that money. Uh, and you're also playing with probabilities that are a lot less uh, probable of happening. <clears throat> so what I've done over times and what I have found out is that I want to take long-term horizons, dump a lot of money, my money into uh, a bunch of different undervalued sectors, and then ride it till they become overvalued. Uh, that usually takes about eight years, sometimes less, maybe two years. Uh, sometimes you can make a lot of money in a very short period of time. That is very much possible. Uh, but that's what I do. That's how I ride it. That's my strategy. And I buy on dips and pullbacks. So that's what I'm looking for. Uh, if you guys are interested in signing up, that's the kind of strategy that I deploy. Uh, it's not trading in and out. It's not trying to time every little market movement uh, and getting all stressed out about it. I take positions. These things are volatile. Don't get me wrong. And uh, I stay long. 
uh, in the things that are of good value. If you guys like this analysis, give me a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe to the channel. If you guys like this, I release these videos every once in a while. And uh, thank you for listening. This is Finding Value.